Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the Moderne Musée and the Axelson Jonsson Foundation for organizing these wonderful two days and for having me here. And ladies and gentlemen, this morning I would like to start by telling you a story. One night, September 25, 1922, a group of young men, mainly men, gathered at 42 Rue Fontaine in Paris. Around 9 p.m. the lights were dimmed. All present sat around a table holding hands, perhaps holding their breath, waiting. After a time, one of them, René, began uttering cries, words and sentences. And upon awakening, he remembered nothing. Immediately, a second attempt was made. Now someone else, Robert, suddenly began to speak, although mainly intelligibly, and he scratched at the table. Afterwards, all considered the night a success and well worth repeating. And so, over the course of many nights, turning into weeks and then months, this group of young people would gather, sometimes the same people, sometimes including others. And quickly, things went further than just uttering some words or scratching at the table. Because during the trance states, let's just call them trance states for the moment, particular people would, for instance, be given pen and paper and they would start writing and drawing. Robert used his pencil to prophesy the death of almost everyone gathered. One night, one of the other participants, Benjamin, flopped at belly down on a table and made swimming motions. Robert telepathically contacted the alter ego of another member of their group, Marcel, in New York, relaying poems, aphorisms, and spoonerisms. In fact, this Robert was particularly successful during these sinister nights, together with Benjamin and René. Others would never enter into trance, but still they were hooked to these, let's just call them seances. And one of the participants, Simone, wrote to her cousin, We are living simultaneously in the present, the past and the future. After each seance, we are so dazed and broken that we swear never to start up again. And the next day, all we can think about is putting ourselves back into this catastrophic atmosphere. Well, catastrophic is the right term here because death became a recurring theme. One night, one of the main participants, André, noticed that half of the group was missing, and when he went looking for them, he found them in a side room trying to hang themselves on the instigation of René. Things were getting really dark and violent. Here is a description of another participant, Louis. Those who submit themselves to these incessant experiments endure a constant state of appalling agitation, becoming increasingly manic. Their trances last longer and longer. The very evident physical ravages suffered by the subjects of this extraordinary experiment, as well as the frequent difficulties in wrenching them from a cataleptic death-like state, will soon force them to give in to the entreaties of the onlookers leaning on the parapet of wakefulness, and suspend the activities which neither laughter nor misgivings have hitherto interrupted. Things were getting out of hand. The sessions came to an end in early 1923. Of course, I'm speaking of the surrealists here, and most of these sessions were held at the house of André Breton and his wife, Simone. Where is my pointer here? Uh, disclaimer, technically, they're still the proto-surrealists in 1923, but I'm going to call them the surrealists anyway. We see the group of them gathered here. This is André Breton, him, sort of the father of surrealism, who was wearing this wonderful eyepiece at the time. Giorgio de Chirico. We see here Robert, the one from my story, who's always entering trances, Louis Aragon, whose text I was just reading at the end, and Simone Caen Breton here in front. The sessions I discussed took place between September 1922 and early 23, and they're generally known as the sleeping sessions. And I will use these sleeping sessions today uh, as the starting point for my discussion of the practice of automatism in surrealism. I will touch upon the esoteric origins of the sleeping sessions, I will discuss surrealism as psychic automatism, techniques of automatism, and, if time allows, make a very brief comparison to of Klint. So the very first impetus for these surrealist sleeping sessions was undoubtedly provided by spiritualism. Two weeks ago, so wrote Breton, René Crevel described to us the beginnings of a spiritualist initiation he had had. A certain Madame D had taught him how to develop particular mediumistic qualities. And so it was that in the conditions necessary for the production of such phenomena, darkness and silence in the room, a chain of hands around the table, 
He had soon fallen asleep and uttered words that were organized into a generally coherent discourse, to which the usual waking techniques put a stop to at any given moment. There's four things I want to point out here. Um, there are conditions necessary for, second point, certain phenomena. The third point is that Crevel fell asleep and then was woken. And finally, the fact that Breton uses terms such as words and discourse. So the conditions first. Clearly, the Surrealists felt that the seance-like setting provided uh, the perfect conditions, or perhaps even essential, for producing the phenomena they sought after. And the Surrealists, not only Crevel, but many of them had experience with spiritualism and mediumism. For instance, during the 1920s, many of the Surrealists visited Madame Sacco, whom we see here, um, a parlor, and had their futures foretold to them. However, the idea that the conditions of the seance are necessary for producing such phenomena was not so much derived from spiritualism as it was derived from psychical research. Um, André Breton, for one, but many others too, were very familiar with the experiments of psychiatrists, psychologists, um, and the experiments they carried out in psychical research. That's a whole story on its own. I'm just condensing it here in these two images. We see two such experiments here of psychiatrists or renowned doctors con uh, taking, conducting experiments with mediums and researching the lucid faculties of the mind, for instance. It's, it's not, a, not a good image, but here is a pair of scissors floating. And the one on the left, we see Theodore Flournois, who is very relevant for the Surrealist. Uh, it's supposedly a picture of him and the medium, Helene Smith. Theodore Flournois, Flournois was a psychiatrist who really wanted to study the whole personality, including the transcendent dimensions. So to have access to, access to those dimensions, he worked in the conditions of the seance, where the medium would be most at ease, and therefore all the sides of her personality would be best displayed. The Surrealists were very familiar with the case of Flournois and Smith, and I would actually argue that their own sleeping sessions were directly based upon the experiments of psychical researchers. So the conditions are the experiment, and they are most conducive to investigating the psyche. Because, in fact, exploring the psyche is the objective. That is what the Surrealists are after. And Breton made it clear in his first definition of Surrealism, 1924. It is psychic automatism in its pure state, by which one proposes to express, verbally, by means of the written word or in any other matter, the actual functioning of thought, dictated by thought, in the absence of any control exercised by reason, and exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. So surrealism itself is psychic automatism, and the psyche is obviously the mind. And in the mind, there is a pure state where direct contact is established with thought. And thought, thought is doing the dictating. So the poet only speaks as his thoughts come to him, as it were. And direct thought is normally kept subliminal by such things as reason or aestheticism or morality. So we see here a sleeping se seance in session. A sleeping session in session, um, sort of, I should say, because this one is restaged. This is not an original one. The sessions ended in 1923, but they restaged them in 1925. This is a photograph by Man Ray. We see here, here you see Man Ray quickly walking into the picture. Here we see André Breton. This is, this is the classical intellectual pose. Eh? So. so he's very being attentive here. Here we see Robert Desnaux, probably entranced, speaking. And we see Simone Kahn at the typewriter, typing everything down. And I don't have time for the gender angle here, but it's quite noticeable that the only woman present is at the typewriter. So what we see here is direct thought speaking, as it were. And because it is direct thought speaking, the person of the poet recedes to the background. Uh, this is also why the typewriter is center stage. Eh? Is it's thought words here that matter, not the person of, of the author. In fact, there is not really an author. Or if there is, it doesn't really matter, because the work in question is not authored. This is, of course, quite subversive in itself, because when there is no author, there can also be no genius. So we see here the surrealist attack on the notion of the genius. And because the poet is not the author, indeed, the surrealist poet should rather be like a device. 
so stated Breton. They should be simple receptacles of so many echoes. They should be modest recording instruments, and if you are an instrument, you are without talent. Again, quite a subversive notion. So we see here the poet, Breton. This is a self-portrait, automatic writing. Uh, incidentally, he's keeping his other, his muse, safely behind bars. And he's holding a device, but of course the idea is that he himself is in, f is in fact supposed to be the device with which to study or investigate thought. So by practicing automatic writing or automatic speaking, the poet makes himself into a device recording himself. It's like psychiatry, but without the patient. <laughs> At the same time, there are obviously clear resonances here with spiritualism, um, because in spiritualism too, the medium was understood uh, to be the medium, a device. So there's a technical discourse underlying all of it here, which is quite prevalent. And the idea is the more automated the process is, the less responsible the medium is, the less responsible the poet is for whatever comes through. Also, the more automated it is, the more pure the thought that you can establish contact with. And pure thought was understood as authentic and original. Pure thought is real, which is why it's the objective of the basis and also the objective of art. So we can therefore say the objective of psychic automatism and surrealism is to gain access to pure thought, which is authentic and original, but only if it is divested of such things as morals or aestheticism or reason. And the automaticity of the whole process is, used, is the means to bypass reason or morality. Now there is a, another sort of more or less natural state in which mankind is exempt from reason and morals, and that is the dream. And pure functioning of thought was in surrealism actually very closely related to dream and sleep states. It is a certain psychic automatism that corresponds rather well to the dream states. Therefore, I interpret the sleeping sessions as sessions of lucid dreaming. They were trying to speak their dreams. Closing the eyes, it signifies that you are not in your normal waking state. You are looking out upon an inner landscape of the imagination or dreams. And in dreams, your thoughts function purely. They are not edited. And if you enter into dreams during the daytime, so if you sleep at night and dream, that's natural. But if you want to enter into dreams during the daytime, you employ a technique such as automatism. And this is also why they were called the sleeping sessions and the surrealist spoke of falling asleep and then waking up, waking up. Well, even though the experiments, uh, the sleeping sessions ended because things became so violent, it's only the form that was discontinued. The technique, automatism, was in fact a great success and continued, continued to be used. And they developed it into different artistic techniques, very closely related to automatic writing is, of course, automatic drawing. André Masson, in particular, practiced automatic drawing from a very early, since the early 1920s and continued throughout his career. And automatism, more and more, it came to be interpreted as a technique that just minimizes the role of the artist as an, as an author as much as possible and giving as much opportunity as possible to free association. And visual techniques still incorporate this element of making it as mechanical, automated as possible. So we see here a painting by Max Ernst. The technique is frottage and grattage. It's rubbing or scraping. And it's something that I used to do as a child, I guess most of you. You have a, a wooden table with a, with a great pattern in it and you just leave a piece of paper lying on it and you go over it with a pencil and you get the, the grain of the wood coming through. That's what frottage is. You can also put on paint and then scrape it down. That's what grattage is and you get effects like this. The idea is, of course, that the work is not conceptualized by the artist in the mind, but it just arises automatically and the artist only needs to fit it in. It's free of intent, or at least that is the idea. You also get automatic photography, uh, which Man Ray said that he invented, he called it the rayograph, where you just leave objects lying on photosensitive paper, wait for the sun to shine, and something happens. Um, you can also do automatic walking, the fugue. You can do decalcomania, working with ink on a paper, folding the paper, uh, fumage, working with smoke. So there are several techniques there. If I had an hour, I would describe them all to you, but unfortunately, we'll have to do that in another life. So we can say, or I can say, would like to say, that in surrealism, 
automatism in all forms was foremost considered a liberating technique. I think Mark already pointed to that. It's a technique to free oneself from the role of having to be the author, to free oneself from the constraints that are placed upon the mind, not only by rationality and morality, but also by training, by artistic tra training. And the idea is to contact your own thought directly and thereby circumvent your rational self and also training. We find the same idea also of freedom, this notion of freedom, artistic freedom through automatism in futurism, or at least in the case of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, who also practiced a, a form of automatism, which he called very tellingly words in freedom. He said in the technical manifesto of futurist literature, this is a wonderful manifesto, I can recommend it to everyone. It's very manifesto-like, <laughs> sorry. They shout at us, your literature won't be beautiful. Where is your verbal symphony, your harmonious swaying back and forth, your tranquilizing cadences? Their loss we take for granted. We make use instead of every ugly sound, every expressive cry from the violent life that surrounds us. Each day we must spit on the altar of art. We are entering the unbounded domain of free intuition. After free verse, here finally are words in freedom. Again, that which is contacted is pure thought, although Marinetti here refers to it as words in freedom, but again, free from the rational self. Because of time constraints, I'm going to limit my examples of automatism um, to one other. It's, it's quite interesting, in fact, that surrealism has become identified with the quintessential uh, avant-garde movement practicing automatism, because there were many artists practicing forms of automatism already in the 19th century. Uh, many artists that have been known to create asylum art or mediumistic art, or perhaps not recognize that artists were still working with automatism, but it's become identified with surrealism. One other very important person is Austin Osman Speer, a British artist and occultist, who really used automatism as a means to explore his own mind. Google this guy, the whole book of automatic drawings is integrally on the internet. So finally, let me make some comparisons with the case of Hilma of Klint. The issue of using automatism as a means of freeing oneself from the constraints of training and the like, uh, at the symposium in February, this has been called de-skilling or unskilling yourself. I see many comparisons here between the surrealists and of Klint and also in the fact that they're both unlike traditional mediums and that they're trained artists, which means that you have this training already that you need to overcome. So both used the seance initially as a way to practice automatism and both later could do without the seance and still practice automatism. The second point where they are unlike is the question of uh, authorship which is directly related to gender, but also related to processes of automatization and mechanization. So the supposedly automatic, which means mechanic, nature of the process, process makes one exempt from having to be the author. Because you are merely an instrument, after all. And in the case of a woman artist, um, as has already been pointed out, pointed out Automatism within a mediumistic context can function as a way to, yeah, it can be interpreted as a strategy to circumvent the fact that there are established gender roles. As a woman, you cannot be an artistic genius. You cannot be original and inventive and create as yourself. Therefore, mediumism operates as a means to bypass that because there is a male spirit, in the case of Afklint Amaliel, who is the agent, as it were. And within spiritualism, mediumism, of course, operated in the same way for many women who could express radical ideas under the guise of mediumism. Obviously, for the surrealists, the gender angle is quite different because they were all male. They were, in fact, primarily concerned with, besides, of course, with free expression, but with subverting traditional notions of authorship and genius. And I could subvert those notions from the very privileged position of being able to reject something that society still deems you capable of attaining, which was not the case for Af Klint. There's a further point I want to make here, and this finally brings me to my conclusion, if I still have a couple of minutes. One minute, wow. Just in time. The question is, what is this automatic message? Um, the works of the femme are group signed, not individually authored, and this is because authorship is irrelevant. 
It's about the message, as Iris Müller-Westermann has also written in the catalogue. I would argue that in the case of Hilma of Klint, automatism is communication. In that way, it's very closely related to spiritualism, which is also about communication. Indeed, it can be seen, spiritualism, as the human equivalent of developing communicative technology. However, for the surrealists, surrealists and also for some of the futurists, the message is that there is no message. It's about expression. Expression which is uninhibited, unedited, uncensored by anything, but especially uncensored by any aesthetic, moral and similar concerns. So the more illogical and strange and transgressive and alienating and just generally weird it is, in fact, the better. This would clearly not be the case for Af Klint, but in surrealism we can say that the automatic message has no content. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessel Boudouin. That intellectual pose, that one, uh, is it, who were the people who were, were into uh, the automatic writing and automatic drawing? Were they, uh, was, was it merely the intellectuals? Did you get working class people there as well? Uh, yeah, I would say actually the, in the history of automatic writing in the 19th century, because it originated in spiritualism and then it's more working class people or middle class people involved in spiritualism who practice automatic writing and automatic drawing within the spiritualist context. And then it was adopted by psychiatry as a curing technique and then again found its way also to art and the intellectuals in art who used it. Um, yeah, it's also in the case of Pessoa as a means of broadening themselves creatively, finding new creative sources. So, so it's not just an intellectual thing, not at all. All segments of society were, yeah. were interested. Yeah, um, I would say so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, before starting my lecture, uh, I would like to thank the Foundation uh, for the invitation to participate on the symposium on Hilma of Klint and her contemporaries. My lecture will attempt to show why 20th century esotericism, and more specifically theosophy, might have been of interest to women artists of the avant-garde who sought to negotiate their position in the male-dominated art world. I do not intend to generalize about the association of women with theosophy, but I will take as my case study the British realist and occultist Ethel Cahoon. Before that, I will briefly, briefly speak about the link between theosophy and women. Women's involvement with esoteric groups was associated with the suffrage movement since the late 19th century. Theosophy, in particular, played a crucial role in the feminist political culture of the time. The Theosophical Society, founded in New York in 1875 by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Henry Steele Alcott, was one of the first esoteric organizations that admitted women in its ranks. This openness to women was in accordance with the Society's commitment to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. The society's receptive attitude toward either sex did not pass unnoticed by several women, either devoted to the women's cause or struggling to identify a space where their voices could be heard and their spiritual and other capacities could be evaluated. Okay. <laughs> The history of the Theosophical Society is marked by the increasing visibility and power of women in spiritual activities, but also by its complicated relationship with both feminist politics and anti-feminist debates over the form and content of spiritual authority. 19th century occultism proved to be the locus where power relations were rene renegotiated and gender identities often reshaped to legitimize spiritual political and other claims. 
During Annie Besant's presidency, between 1907 and 1933, the Theosophical Society was fraught with controversies and protests and was also engaged in a complex and shifting discourse on spirituality and gendered categories such as male, female and intermediate sex. Although Theosophy served as a site of struggle in which contending ideas concerning womanhood and antithetical versions of esotericism existed in tension with each other, it offered women social and intellectual opportunities unavailable to them in other religious and secular loci. Theosophy, as expounded initially by Madame Blavatsky and later by Annie Besant, was attractive to women for various reasons. It offered a form of religiosity that often celebrated female spiritual authority. It rejected a masculinized anthropomorphic God and embraced instead a divine father mother. It often repudiated a traditional male dominated priesthood and also it developed the notion of self consciousness in non gendered terms. It is not therefore mere coincidence that theosophy was appealing to several women modernists who sensed within it a liberating force. British Ethel Cahoon provides a good example of a woman artist associated with one of the most influential avant-garde artistic movements of her era, surrealism, but also with theosophy and more broadly, esotericism. On the right, we can see Cahoon in her 20s, and on your left, she's in her 40s. A few generations younger than Hilma of Klint, Cahoon grew up in the early 20th century when theosophy and its effort to reconcile religions, philosophy and science was still in vogue. The scientific spirituality promoted by theosophy was attractive to several contemporaries who sought to explore the physical, and the spiritual planes, and to awaken the latent faculties within the self. Cahoon's occult preoccupations saw her abiding interest in their investigation of both the natural world and human consciousness akin to theosophical pursuits. As she herself admitted, she got involved in esoteric organizations because she sought enlightenment. Very significantly, in the early 20th century, this sort of enlightenment could be pursued by women only within theosophical and certain other esoteric societies that created a viable space for artists like Afklind and Cahoon who wished to probe the nature of reality and the mysteries of the inner self. The Quest Society, founded in 1909, by the former secretary of the Theosophical Society in England, George Mead, was the first esoteric group Cahoon joined in 1928. At the meetings, organized by the Quest Society, she acquired her basic esoteric knowledge. This is seminal in understanding Cahoon's initial contact with occultism, which was theosophically inspired. Cahoon was quite well read in the writings of Madame Blavatsky, Annie Besant, Anna Kingsford, Clara Codd, Rudolf Steiner, and George Mead. Her library contains works by the aforementioned theosophists and numerous books published by the Theosophical Publishing House. Moreover, Cahoon was a member of the Theosophical Society in England, although there is no solid evidence about the date of her admittance and the duration of her membership. Her notes, writings and artwork show that although she was cognizant of theosophical ideas, she did not embrace all the tenets of theosophy and took an eclectic attitude toward her sources. In addition, she was acquainted with other contemporary esoteric organizations antagonistic to the theosophical society, such as the, Herm the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. As a result, it is a pitfall to interpret her art simply from a theosophical perspective, since theosophy is recognized as one of the diverse esoteric systems she familiarized herself with. As shall be shown, her engagement with esotericism influenced her art in terms of technique and imagery. The present lecture does not aim to be exhaustive and will specifically focus on the art she produced during the 1940s, since this is a decade that saw her shift to an art that weaved together surrealism and occultism. Cahoon 
was studying at the Slade School of Fine Arts in London when she joined the Quest Society. Her art, at the time, included naturalistically painted subjects, mythological and biblical themes, portraits and still life. This is an example. <coughs> However, from the beginning of the 1930s and throughout the decade, she started painting vegetal, floral and other organic forms in a style she later called magic realism or super realism. It is made evident by her choice of words that this kind of painting sought to represent a supra reality. In this instance, a natural world imbued with life forces invisible to the human eye. For example, we can see her oil from 1935, which depicts crane flowers resembling semi-human formations. In this period, her painting is still largely figurative, while esoteric or theosophical connotations are either absent or implicit. What is evident is Cahun's pantheistic worldview. Her perspective is also pervasive in her writings. For example, at the beginning of the 1930s, she confessed that she was a natural animist and did not believe in a supreme being. While, a few years later, she admitted, and I quote, I am identified with every leaf and pebble, and any threat and hurt to the wilderness of the valley seems to me like a rape. Cahun's animistic view of the cosmos is largely predicated on theosophy, whose vision of a spiritualized world reiterates in her work. Her effort to reveal pictorially the invisible aspects of the universe becomes more apparent in the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s. It is at this period that she gives her works esoteric titles, such as the Androgyne, the Second Adam, and others. Crucial for her development is also her contact with surrealism. In Italy, Cahun became acquainted with the movement when she briefly lived in Paris at the beginning of the 1930s. In 1936, she was impressed by Salvador Dali's illusionistic double images, while in 1939, she visited André Breton's apartment in Paris, where she was introduced into surrealist automatism and a new technique invented by Roberto Mata and Gordon Onslow Ford called psychological morphology. Uh, Cahun describes psychological morphology, and I quote, as an effort to tap that level of consciousness, sometimes perceptible between sleeping and waking, which consists of colored organic forms in a state, in a state of flux. Cahun regarded psychomorphology as the intensification of the automatic processes developed by another surrealist, Max Ernst, and used automatic processes throughout her career to depict the non-corporeal dimensions of the phenomenal, phenomenal world. In a text she called The Mantic Stain and published in 1949, Cahun further reveals her perspective on automatism. It is important that she emphatically stresses the conscious modification of forms made automatically, thus dissociating surrealist automatism from spiritualist mediums, passive will, and the model of the female entranced subject, and associating it with occultism that encourages the operation of the active will. This text is highly significant because she established the link between automatism and occultism, whose practices, she argues, are dependent on the unconscious mind of the operator. Cahun presents automatism as the medium through which the artists could reveal their fantastic life and compares them with clairvoyants and alchemists. She also associates automatic techniques with the four elements and with the astral plane, expressing her conception of automatic art as a product of alchemical projection and of astral manifestation. Although Cahun's objective is to bring up to the surface a treasury of symbolic scenes or mind pictures, as she calls them, it is suggested that these images do not emerge only from the unconscious of the artist, but also from the spiritualized cosmos.
This conflation of the internal with the external might echo André Breton's proclamation about the synthesis of dream and reality in a state he called surreality in his first manifesto, but also owes much to Cahun's esotericism and her conception of consciousness in esoteric terms. As her artwork from the 1940s demonstrates, it is through automatism that Cahun attempts to capture visually the invisible forces permeating external reality and the unconscious, creating what could be described as interior landscapes or spiritualized landscapes. For example, in Guardian Angel, she translates pictorially the unseen forces of animating nature, thus creating the image of a semi-human female figure protectively embracing the natural world. The conjunction of the angelic winged figure with a vaginal outline is striking, alluding to the motif of the winged uterus and the spiritualization of matter. The same idea is conceptualized differently in C star 1, in this case, we see an abstract, fish-like flower hovering beneath a marine landscape that could be read as a large cosmic vulva. The title alludes to both Isis and Virgin Mary, two manifestations of the divine feminine, according to Blavatsky. In both cases, Cahun celebrates not only woman's transformative powers, but also her own creativity. In other automatic works, she moves to an exploration of the complete fusion of opposites. In A Visitation One, she portrays spiritual entities in the process of interaction, union, and transmutation. Their presence is visually manifested through brilliant antithetical colors and shapes interconnected to each other in an abstract geometric synthesis. In autumnal equinox, the balancing of polarities, such as night and day, darkness and light, takes place within an ambiguous, asexual body, marked with whirling centers of energy on the head, the heart, and the genitalia, evoking the power of chakras. Again, color and unguarding forms function as the medium to convey complex spiritual concepts, both microcosmically and macrocosmically. Although these images were automatic products, their completion rested upon Cahun's conscious modification of initially accidental forms that offered the inspirational basis to develop her explorations of art, spirituality, and gender dynamics. It could be argued that the appearance of certain legible motifs can be counted as an involuntary trace of repeated themes, which she also pursues in, in, uh, I'm sorry, in her non-automatic works as conscious subject matter. Since an example is alchemical figure, the opal one, uh, in Cahun's words, the abstract image signifies, I quote, by its combination of colors, the animal, vegetable, and mineral worlds, and leaks the whole morphological system with the idea of balance between static and dynamic forces. It is significant that Cahun uses, again, non-figurative pictorial means, which she often combines with a gender-free visual vocabulary to articulate her vision of the balancing of opposites. Her vision is also embodied in images such as Diagrams of Love, Christian Marriage 2, uh, in which a semi-abstract, asexual figure with a cross in each chest serves as an allegory of the complete reconciliation and integration of male and female principles into a whole. As was made clear, Cahun was exploring the idea of nature as a living organism inhabited by infinite creative forces, usually identified as female, and the notion of the duality and the ultimate union of all life. These ideas were common among occultists, and theosophists in particular, so it is not easy to identify her initial source. Nevertheless, Madame Blavatsky's concepts of the universe as an ensouled whole and of the genderless universal divine principle and the impersonal higher self, without doubt, exercised an influence upon her thinking.
It is not striking that the same themes are also found in Afklin's work. It seems that Madame Blavatsky's theories offered new possibilities of those wishing to rethink female subjectivity, but also blur the lines between the masculine and the feminine. Women artists involved with theosophy were quick to embrace these ideas and claim their right to attain self-realization and their spiritualized self on equal footing with men. Although the two women lived in different cultural contexts, their work could be viewed within the broader historical context of European avant-garde and its interaction with esotericism in the first decades of the 20th century. Both women resorted to automatism as a form of resistance <coughs> to the academic art of the time, which was largely masculinized, and the means by which they could explore the non-corporeal, the psychic, the spiritual. Afklin's initial use of automatism should be read in relation to her spiritualist experiments that relied upon, upon an ambiguous identification of higher consciousness with spirits dictating images to a passive, receptive female subject. Cahun's automatism, on the other hand, should be situated within a surrealist context, which again exhibited an ambivalent attitude toward women and creativity, when, for example, it often feminized the unconscious and automatism. Nevertheless, André Breton, in one of his famous texts, he argued that all human beings are equal before the subliminal message, and every woman and man deserved, I quote, to be convinced of their ability to tap into automatic language at will, which is the vehicle of revelation. This indeed is a more egalitarian view of consciousness that does not uh, dwell on the difference between the sexes, but their sameness and equity before unconscious messages and the creative process. It comes then without surprise that an art based on automatic abstraction as a medium to reveal the concealed dimensions of human consciousness found resonance in Cahun's work. Abstraction, seemed the most suitable language to convey not only hidden realities, but also a consciousness where the boundaries between the internal and the external, the masculine and the feminine, the physical and the supersensible, were no longer sustained. Cahun's inability to perceive the spiritual plane in figurative terms is articulated when she related that supersensible entities should be expected, I quote, to manifest themselves in some abstract geometric shape or perhaps forms resembling crystals of the basic structure of organic life. Like Hilma of Klint, Cahun explored the visual potential of automatism, developing a more abstract imagery that could represent the ineffable. What is, however, most striking is that for both artists, abstraction also evoked the spiritual as a more egalitarian space in which women could explore, conceptualize, reveal and access a multi-layered universe and a multiple inner self. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria Ferentino. I'm sorry for, for your problems with the slides. Don't worry. <laughs> Still a very interesting lecture. Uh, while I ask you a question, could I ask um, Tessa Boudouin, Marco Passi and Stephen Kahn to come up on stage and take your places behind the tables? Thank you. Was Hilma Clint a feminist? Well, uh, this is a very tricky question. <laughs> We don't have evidence that uh, Hilma Afklin was politically involved in feminism, in political feminism. But I think if we define feminism as a way of resistance and of uh, visualizing again the world, a world where the feminine and the masculine are equally placed, then perhaps we can say that it, she was a proto-feminist in a way, in her own way. But. Uh, the meaning of the term feminism and feminist varies and changes and, well, it's uh, a question many scholars discuss even today and they don't agree with each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Okay>. <laughs> we <laughs> can't really uh, say how feminist Afklint was, but right. her way of um, uh, doing something different from the academic art and doing that in isolation on her own, yeah. uh, for me, it's, it's a statement. 
and perhaps her fear to show her work in an exhibition, uh, it's not only of the content, of the spiritual content of the paintings, but because she was a woman, and then she could be doubly criticized for that. Mm. A woman, a revolutionary. Thank you for that. Ooh. Please take your seat. Thank you. you don't have to, you can share a table, that's okay. <laughs> um, could we start by talking about the importance of space and time? Uh, what would the reaction be if this would be Paris 1911 and uh, Hilma of Klint was exhibiting? Me, I'm the space and time person. Is <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Kahn, go for space and time. I have no idea. 1911, I have no idea. I mean, the, her, the, her drama is that she was, she was uh, secretive, and it would have been exciting and um, probably ignored, uh, dismissed as uh, you know someone who was getting messages from uh, uh, unreliable sources, uh, possibly you know someone who was, uh, you know, I mean, the, the negative would be. Um, these are self-hypnosis or self-induced images. Uh, they probably would that would obscure and ignore the the the, the magnificence of her art. I think. Uh, I mean, this is for myself. It's an, a, an ongoing problem. Not a problem. I mean, it's an intriguing matter that I, I find that the sources any any extra any metaphysical source to me is entirely dubious. Um, I re re view it as all auto-suggestion or some sort of uh, empirical experience that she was mediated and, and, and influenced by these seances and they were moving experiences and uh, trance-like. I don't know what, what, what that sort of thing is like, uh, uh, but out came this great art. <laughs> A lot of people go to seances, they don't produce the 10 largest and that's, that's what's so dramatic about all this. You know? So I, I would hope that they would take it up in 1911. And they'd probably be interpreting it through Kandinsky, because he gave the language. This is another thing I've been commenting, thinking about, is that you know, we don't paint our interpretations of paintings. We write them, and everything gets translated into language. And so as we do it, it's sort of impoverished. I mean, there's one place where Picasso said, you know, uh, cubism is related to trigonometry and God knows what else, and he laid out chemistry and all sorts of things. He says, that's just pure nonsense. <clears throat> of course, I make a living doing that, you know. So <laughs> that's what art historians do. They use words. What about the rest of you? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, in the case of Georgiana Hot Houghton, we know what would happen if this were London uh, 1871. Yes, we do. Because it did happen. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, I have the impression that um, for Hilma of Klint, if she had decided to exhibit her paintings, she might uh, have been received uh, positively, uh, depending on whether she would have been able to connect with the right networks, mm. perhaps, to find the right place. Mm. Uh, uh, so I think there is a social dimension uh, to art that uh, we should we should keep in mind. It's not just about uh, the shape, the form, the style, uh, even the artistic quality itself, but also how uh, the pure social factor is important. So to connect with the right people, for instance, and uh, and to be in the right place, in the right gallery, or you know, in the in the right space, actually. So. Um, if she had been a friend of Kandinsky, for instance, or of Mondrian, well, that would have helped. Mm -hmm. um, if she had decided to exhibit, for instance, only uh, in uh, um, a temple or a lodge of the Theosophical Society, well, things would have been different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you, but it's uh, Victoria. You said that uh, it's uh, likely that she was hesitant to exhibit her work because she was a woman? Yes, uh, one of the reasons. One of the reasons. Was the spiritual dimension, the thing that would not be accepted, and then because she was a woman. And this was, I mean, more um, innovative, let's say. And perhaps she was not very uh, certain of her creativity, of what she was doing. She was exploring art through abstraction, but she was not quite sure about she, what she was doing. You think so? I think that's, yes. uh, that's odd, that because the impression one gets when one walks through the exhibition, I think, is this she needs enormous conviction. 
this is, wh this is why she's trying to accord this authority to the spirits in Italy. But when she grows, you know, she's starting to do things more consciously. But mm. at the beginning, she was a bit uh, reluctant mm. to accept her own authority. Mm. This is my personal opinion, of course. <laughs> What do you think, uh, Tessa Bulwai? I think if she were exhibiting in the 1920s in Paris without any context whatsoever, she would run the risk of being uh, conceptualized within the context of asylum art. Perhaps her work would be collected by psychiatrists and directors of asylums because she's seen in the 1910s and 1920s that art of patients but also art of mediums is very is often combined as art of people who are not in their right minds, but which is still something that's interesting to collect because those people who are not in their right minds, they have direct access to their pure subliminal, but it's more a curiosity than really art. So I would say she would run that risk. But if, if I were Hilma of Klint, I wouldn't want to have exhibited in Paris in the 1920s because I think she was not, she was more concerned with the message, with painting, and less with showing yourself to the world and also with things like making money, getting recognition, establishing a network in the art world. I think those things were quite irrelevant or less relevant to her. I think the, uh, her priority was painting. I think exhibiting is quite a modern, yeah, contemporary even, collector's world way of looking at art. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing that she managed to do all those paintings in, in her outsider position, right? Without having any but why? encouragement. Why, why would that be amazing? I why, would Why never. would you need... She didn't have encouragement from the spirits. Yeah. <laughs> so that was enough for her. Yeah, but, but there, I think there was also internal conviction. I think it's it's about passion and about drive. Yeah, I think she what didn't a drive need. It is. Yeah, she it's didn't need to be confirmed drive. by outsiders or by money or by collectors. There was just this message and this drive that was enough for her. What was it for? Why why do you put these messages on uh, on paper? I think that is why we all need to read the diaries. I don't yes. know. <laughs> she knew because she wrote it all down. No. I can't read Swedish. So it's I don't quite know, amazing that she did it, though. That's, yes. that's, that scale. That's, that's totally true. I think we are still at uh, level zero of understanding uh, Hilma yeah. of Clint mm. and especially her motivations. Mm. Uh, until serious study uh, is done with the diaries, uh, yeah, much of uh, what we say is actually speculation. So we know certain facts, we know certain things, but uh, knowing that she wrote uh, thousands of pages in her diary, well, what's in these thousands of pages? Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I think certain things can be said, but uh, there is probably a lost continent also there in those pages. So uh, No, I agree, <coughs> and I think we should be wary of filling her in too much. Right, right. I think we shouldn't sort of leave here all today thinking that we know Hilma of Klint, because we don't. That is part of the drama of it, that there's these 26,000 pages, <laughs> <coughs> and we're not even sure that she explains in those pages what it is we want to know. Uh, why do we, what, as a historian, I want to know why do people think and do what they do when they do. I'm always asking, always trying to date things. What's 1906-ish? about that. Yeah. Of course, one of the points I made is if you're getting messages from ancient sources, uh, that's an interesting problem. Well, we can still entertain the hope that at least in 20, uh, 27,000 pages, at least a couple will be yes, relevant yes. for <laughs> understanding uh, yeah. what was going on. Yeah. yeah. Editors. That would be editors. enough. Yeah. But I agree there is a need for translation in English of yes, her yes, diaries. Yes, yes, yes. We've got a great for advantage, yes. uh, the or Swedes among Swedish. us. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a uh, exactly. It's, would you all four of you be interested in tackling Hilma of Clint as a research project? Totally. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> of course. But it is is it possible that in those twenty six thousand pages, our question was not answered? Yeah. That she just didn't address that. Mm. That would be something. Add to the drama and the mystery of it. If you read 26,000 pages and you don't find the answer... It well, all questions... <laughs> well, I think all questions are never answered. Uh, it's still... I think some questions can be answered, and some are just matter for interpretation and argument. So uh, I think uh, the final word will never be said, but that's the same for artists uh, we already know better. Sure. So 
and not just for artists, but also for philosophers, uh, writers, and so on. So, depending also on the context in which we move, the time uh, in which we uh, were raised and, and uh, in which we learn to think, then also interpretations change. So, the important thing about Hilma F. Klint is that she's saying something to us today and that she is important to us today. What, what she did makes sense to us today. And the question is also why. And this is not just uh, uh, based on what she wanted to do, her motivations, but also what we are today, actually, and what is our culture and, and how our society functions today. Very tricky question. Uh, what is she saying? Ha. Ah. I think that uh, uh, when, you, when you ask this question, then you want to have a discourse, right? Because mm. we, we say saying as if it's, it's about the discourse. But uh, I don't think that this is the only way where you can uh, uh, approach uh, visual material like that. There is also an aesthetic experience, mm. which uh, cannot necessarily be put into, you know, kind of discourse. Uh, so, uh, well, I think that, and I can speak personally here, um, they certainly say something to me uh, in the kind of experience I have when I, when I see them, when I see the paintings. So, uh, there is a kind of visual power that is there. Um, so, uh, that's already quite some way to, uh, for me to, uh, uh, to uh, justify talking about her. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, there is the cultural side of it, which is uh, trying to understand also why she was trying to say certain things, why uh, she had a special drive, she has a special motivation. Yeah, that's the side of a scholar, of course, mm. you know, trying to mm. contextualize and, and make a history out of it. Mm. You say that she was encouraged by spirits, but... Um, Half jokingly, of course, but uh, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I I can't imagine these pieces being that intuitive. You know, I get the impression that these pieces are, and you touched upon it, Stephen Kern. I think in your lecture that sh you gave the impression of her being almost well read, that she knew of the different scientific uh, challenges of the day and. No, I, I uh, didn't really intend to say that. I just said, I was asked to speak about that matter. These things are in the air. There are evidence in, in some of the images that the, she might have known about X-ray and that sort of thing, and, and radio waves, and maybe even you know, a double helix uh, before her, before about 30, 40 years before her time. But um, no, I don't know. I, I have, as you were speaking, uh, there were sort of two questions I would, like to, I would like to have answered. One I know are not answered in those 26,000 pages. The one that might be would be an explanation of something like Kandinsky provides concerning the spiritual learner about what art needs to do and why, why abstraction is a better, better um, vehicle for that. The other thing is I'd like to know how her personal life, her love life, uh, fed into or g generated repeated images of men and women together or apart and not together. And here's someone who, <clears throat> as far as the little I know, did not have a, a really fulfilling uh, male-female relationship. That fascinates me. Can I, can I add something to that? I think there is, uh, sexuality is a very important issue here. Yeah. Uh, uh, all three uh, examples that I have mentioned in my paper were similar in this respect because they were all celibate uh, during their life. Uh, so even Pessoa had a love affair which was very brief and uh, for the rest of his life he uh, remained single. And this goes beyond gender because this, this applies both to Georgiana Houghton and him and Clint, they were both women, but also to Pessoa who was a man. So there is an issue of sexuality, which I think is distinct from uh, the issue of gender, and which I think is also important there. Um, and uh, also, I think that one important element to be kept in mind, uh, I, I, I didn't mention this, but I think it is important now after the papers that came after me, is that automatic writing and uh, communication with entities, uh, spirits, and so on, is not exactly the same thing because automatic writing or uh, automatic drawing is a psychological process, is a psychological phenomenon. And communication with the spirits is the interpretation, subjective interpretation that you give of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do automatic writing. You just take a pen, uh, you uh, put it on a piece of paper, and then you let your hand go. This is, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not extraordinary or uh, esoteric or magical. Tess, what do you yeah. think of that? Well, I would add to that, to come back to your question, that being in an automatic state or in a dissociative state is not something that 
can, that's only five minutes or 10 minutes. So perhaps in her case, those states took longer amounts of time and in those times she could paint those paintings. It's not that she was automatic for five minutes and then the ideas came to her and she painted them then. Well, I think it is because I don't know. But early on in her career, she attributed all her paintings directly to, to Amalia or to the spirits. So she might have been painting automatically as it were for long hours at a time and perhaps at a later stage in her career consciousness returned more and more during the process of painting. But I think we should, whether or not she was communicating, I would say that the state of automatism or painting in this particular state could be a very long, so she could have made all of them more or less automatically. Mm -hmm. Victoria Valentino? I totally agree with uh, Tessel's insight. And I think that in the 20s and the 30s, when Cahun also started working in automatism, uh, there was a different conception of automatism, that yeah. you uh, are first dissociated, you have dissociation, and then you come back, consciousness come back, and you consciously modify, modify the images uh, that are the imprint or the trace of automatic processes. So there is a combination of dissociation and authorship, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This and also, changes, perhaps, yes. if I might add to that, I think we should also consider if something would happen to one of us today, we would use the word flow. Sometimes when you're working, or, or at least I am when I'm writing, you get into this flow and you just see where you're going and it's, and it's great and you lose sense of time. Flow or losing sense of time is a modern contemporary way of talking about it. Perhaps it also happened to have Clint or to others in the 1910s or 1920s and flow was not a term for it and they called it automatic you're just going and it's going very well and you're not even thinking about what you're doing and something wonderful and creative is coming out. So it's also, we're coming back to discourse then that you should be really looking towards what is the context in which she operated? Why is she using certain terms? <coughs> Why are others around her using certain terms and how do they relate to her direct historical context? Perhaps if she were living today, we would describe her in entirely different terms and her work as well. Thank you for that. That's uh, all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you.